put it on one of our vehicles? Yeah, you want to. Okay, just place your hand behind your back for me. Perfect. And then, right now, I can put a finger in each of these, okay? And I'm just going to double off this so they don't tighten up on you on the way out there. Where's your car? It's out there. Yeah. I'm about to come in. Um, you don't have anything on you that I should know about, correct? Any weapons, anything that we're going to find. Before you put you in a police vehicle, we need to search your person to make sure you don't have anything on you. Is there anything you have on you? Okay. I'm going to search you before we put you in his car. That's just protocol, so I'm just going to have you step right over here. And then just widen your legs, widen your stance. Yep, perfect. Are you wearing a bra? Okay. I'm just going to go like this through and make sure you don't have anything. You said you're not wearing a bra? Okay. Is that just like a tank top under here? Okay. Just going to lift up your hair. Okay. All right, you're just going to walk with Officer Hines. No, go out this way. And then, hey, Hines. You want to go this way or that way? Yeah. Okay. And then if you want to go down the downstairs yeah. into the interview room downstairs. Sounds good. Thank you going you. down or I'm going down? You're going down. I'll come you. I appreciate it. I was going to ask you to come turn my car off, but I'm leaving now. So we're good. Yeah. It's still on. Okay. Hey, bud. Uh, hold on. Well. Well. If you want to ask, uh, yeah, I got you. just so we can tell them who we're taking down there. This way. My view. Sorry, one. Yeah, Captain. Oh, uh, he told me. She told me transfer it down, then she'll move okay, it. Okay. Yeah. Take me in your car. Then yeah. I'll move it. Appreciate it. Ruby, what's your last name? Just so I could tell them I'm transferring. Okay. Control traffic 13. I'll be trying to turn Ruby to number 12. I'll give you my beginning here in a minute. I'll come up and I'll come back and grab it after they get back here. You guys got it? Yeah, that's it. That's it. Yeah, that's it. Sorry, brown hand grip. I thought it was pink. Alright. Thanks, sir. Bye. Come on up, please. We'll go that way. Close that door. What's that? Downstairs in the interview room. So I could have gone that way, but I appreciate opening the door. We'll take these stairs right here. This next one right right here. Right. 
and I'll go ahead and I'll give everyone just a test for here. Go to the other end of them. This way, yeah. Okay, go ahead and have a seat. son himself, the emaciated 12-year-old boy who broke free from duct tape shackles and ran for help. His escape exposed the shocking abuse at the hands of his mother, Ruby Frankie, I'll wait till I have a lawyer. and her friend, disgraced psychiatrist Jody Hildebrandt. If you knew all the pieces, I think you'd have a lot of empathy for well, what's going on. And the details of the boy's abuse proved to be more horrific than we could have ever imagined. Medical got there, they started cutting his, cutting the stuff off him. And then you can see like the, the dark around his ankles and it, it, you could smell it with the flesh. By now you know the story of Ruby Frankie, the once famed YouTube mom who turned convicted child abuser. Frankie rose to fame documenting the lives of her children on the YouTube channel Eight Passengers that at one point had more than 2 million followers. Critics pointed out Frankie's alarming parenting tactics far before her arrest. And my kids are literally starving. I hesitate to say this because it's going to sound like I'm like a mean barbarian, but I told the kids, I said, I'm not even going to let you eat breakfast <laughs> until you get your chores done. But it was August 30th, 2023, when things really changed for Frankie. Place your hand on your back for me. Perfect. And then... That's when this harrowing 911 call was made. This kid has obviously been... I think he's been... He's been detained. He's been... He's obviously covered in wounds. We've played the call for you dozens of times here on Law and Crime Network, but this is the first time we're actually seeing what led up to it. This week, Washington County, Utah finally released dozens of documents, photos, audio recordings, and videos, all relating to the Frankie case, and we're getting a first-hand look at what happened. We know that on August 30th of last year, the Frankie's son, who we are identifying as RF, broke free from Jody Hildebrandt's Ivan's Utah home and ran for help. Here's a video of him approaching a neighbor's home and ringing the bell. You can see RF ring the bell and wait at the front door for someone to answer. As he stands there, RF is emaciated with extremely small legs. You can see the duct tape around his ankles. He's wearing a ragged long sleeve shirt that has blood on the arm and socks without shoes. When RF knocks on the door, it's soft, almost as if he's too weak to make a loud bang. After about two minutes waiting at this home, RF leaves and heads to another neighbor's home. The next neighbor RF visits makes the infamous 911 call and the entire thing is caught on ring camera video. Here you can see the boy slowly approach the door before pressing the intercom.
At first, it seems like no one will answer the door as there's an automated response. Answer the door right now. But if you'd like to leave a message, you can do it now. So RF starts to walk off before we hear what sounds like a door opening. Yes. RF turns around and faces the neighbor, asking for what he calls some favors. Hi, how is this? Wondering if you could do two favors. Well, what are they? Uh, taking me to the nearest police station. The man asks the boy what's going on, and he replies, it's personal business. Well, actually, it's just one fine. Well, what's going on, son? Have a seat there. It's, it's personal business. The neighbor asks RF how he got over there before the video cuts out. What's your name? I, I... We now know RF broke free from duct tape shackles after months of abuse. He and his younger sister were found in such poor condition that they needed to be hospitalized after their rescue. Next, we see video of the neighbor making the infamous 911 call that up until now we only had heard audio for. As you can see, RF is within earshot of the call. Two, 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 one, five, one, two. I just had a 12-year-old boy show up here at my front door asking for help, and he uh, said he had just came out from a neighbor's house, and he's emaciated, he's got tape around his legs, he's hungry, and he's thirsty. Need someone immediately. Another video shows the man still on the line with 911. He has duct tape around and these injuries. Injury. There's sores around them. Yeah, there's sores around them. I think the the good chance he's been. Uh, and he also has. Oh, and he has around his ankle as well. I mean his wrist as well. Okay, this boy has been. Needs immediate attention. Mm -hmm. The 911 recording is famous for the neighbor tearing up during the call as he explains the boy's condition. We now know that as one neighbor was saying all this, the other was comforting RF. Oh, he was such a good kid. Don't this kid is not very stupid. I think he's been... I think he's been... He's been detained. He's been... He's obviously covered in wounds. <laughs> In another Ring video from the same house, we see RF eating for the first time as emergency responders arrive. He's hungry and uh, he's been young then. He's had a very stocking feet. Uh, so he, he escaped. Yeah, he's escaped. We need the police here now. Yeah, no. You know, have any allergies in that? The neighbors wave for the ambulance to come closer as they tell RF he's going to be checked out. Separate body camera video shows one of the first responders begin to cry after seeing RF's wounds. Soon, RF is loaded into the back of an ambulance. Body camera video shows a sergeant speak with a boy, saying he needs a few pictures of the wounds. Hey, I'm Sergeant Tolbert. I'm going to just get a few pictures of your face, huh? Washington County released photos of the boy's wounds and his sister's, but we've decided not to show them because they're too gruesome. Additional video of RF being treated has been partially redacted, but you can hear a first responder remind the boy he's not in trouble. How did you get the ropes on you? Who did him? 
You're not in trouble with me, okay? We're just trying to figure out what's going on. Our main focus right now is you, okay? Who put the ropes on you? Supposed to help you what? An officer later describes RF's wound, saying he could smell the flesh. First observed the kid, he was sitting on the chair, had the um, duct tape and plastic around uh, his ankles. And then he had a long sleeve shirt on, and then we pulled his sleeves up and he had duct tape and clear plastic underneath the sleeves on both wrists. And then uh, medical got there, they started cutting his, cutting the stuff off him. And then you can see like the, the dark around his ankles and it, it, you could smell it with the flesh. So underneath the tape, as soon as they took it off, you can, even outside you can smell. You can smell the, the flesh. And then um, the transport, or put them in the ambulance. I went in there. Um, they started cutting more off of it. You can see the wounds on the back of his ankles, around the front of his ankles. Um, and then on his wrists as well. And. Um, the wounds around his ankles were dark and, um, like, I don't know, like wet looking, I guess, from the moisture underneath it. Yeah, he said, he said, uh, he was tied on the ground with a rope. That's where the wounds came from. Yeah, with ropes on all four of his extremities. And that's where the wounds came from. And then um, they put the put yeah they put cayenne pepper mixed with uh, honey. He said on the wounds, and then covered that with the plastic saran wrap and then the duct tape over the wounds. Yeah. And then that's what we cut off was that. Yeah, they dressed the wounds. Um, some of the wounds when I was in there, um, when they went to go um, peel it, they thought it was some of the dressing. It was actually his skin that was peeled. Jody, I need you to step out. I have I have my turn. That's great. Step out of the house. No, I'm not going to step out of step the house. Step out of the house. Step out of the house. Whoa, 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 whoa. We're just going to step out of the house. Is there anybody else home? Wait a minute. How do you come to my house? Right there. Who can they come on into my house? Just have a seat right there. Do you have a search warrant? Have a seat right there. Do you have a search warrant? Have a seat right there. I'll explain everything after. Have a seat right there. Do you have a search warrant, sir? Control 12X11. Can you hold the air? We're searching the house. I can tell you what's in the house. Okay. Just have a seat right there for me. Do you have a search warrant? We'll explain it after this. You can't just come into my house without a search warrant. We'll explain everything after this, ma'am. Okay. Well, that's one of the reasons why we're here. So we'll explain after everything's done, after we clear the house and make sure everything's fine in but there. But why are you coming into my house without a we'll search warrant? We'll explain it after this. But that doesn't make sense. You come into my house and do what you want, and then you tell me you don't have a no, warrant? No, we'll explain why we did. But don't you have to have a warrant? Not at this moment, we don't. We're here on exigent circumstances, and I'll explain it after this, after my sergeant and the officer are done clearing the house.
Is there anybody else in the house? Yes. Two kids? There's a little girl. Just one? She's right over here. Okay. How old is she? She'll be 10 next week. Okay. And she's on this side? Mm-hmm. I have Airbnb guests over there. Probably scared me to death. Okay. And they're on this side of the house then? They're right over there. She's over here. Can you get through the house that way? Yes, they just okay. have to go right there. There's no other kids besides her? No. What's her name? Should be off to where are you at? Should be off to the left, right in there. To the main bedroom. That's right there. How do you get there from the inside? Walk around the corner. There's a little hall, and it's the first. It's just around the corner, the down the hall. Second door to the right. You come in, my buddy. I am a police officer. We're getting a glimpse into newly released video showing the devastating moments after police encounter the children of disgraced YouTuber Ruby Frankie. Officials have recently released a large amount of evidence against the former mom blogger who is serving a lengthy prison sentence for felony aggravated child abuse. Frankie and her then business partner Jody Hildebrandt's arrest were triggered after Frankie's 12-year-old son was found emaciated with open wounds and duct tape around his body. A newly released ring camera video, the young boy appears thinner and without shoes in stark contrast to how he appeared years earlier in Frankie's vlog. When he rings a neighbor's doorbell, he asks, can you take me to the nearest police station? Yes. The neighbor then calls 911. Tell me exactly what's happened. I just had a 12-year-old boy show up here at my front door asking for help. And he uh, said he had just came from a neighbor's house, and we know there's been problems at this neighbor's house. He's emaciated, he's got tape around his legs, he's hungry, and he's thirsty. Is, he, is your door locked? No, I'm sitting outside with him on the, on the front patio. Okay, cool. And he asked us to call the police. What's so he's very afraid. The neighbor's out of their home, or is anybody looking for him that you can see? Uh, no. We, our homes are far enough away. Uh, I'm not sure. How did you get out of the house? Uh, porch. He went out He says he just left through the porch at the neighbor's house. Um, her name is Jody Hildebrand, and she lives two doors up the street. Body cam video later shows officers and emergency responders arriving. One EMT seems so shocked by the extent of Frankie's son's injuries, she can be heard saying, I'm going to cry. Frankie's son is later put inside an ambulance for treatment, where video shows officers talking to the young boy while he's on the gurney and asking who put the duct tape on him. How did you get the ropes on you? Who did him? You're not in trouble with me. 
Okay, we're just trying to figure out what's going on. Our main focus right now is you. Okay, who put the ropes on you? Supposed to help you what? Portions of the evidence have been redacted. While he's being treated, he tells the officers he's not the only one who needed help. His sister is still inside Hildebrandt's home. When officers go inside of the home, that's when they make another heartbreaking discovery. Ruby Frankie's young daughter, who we're referring to as EF, sitting inside of the closet, cross-legged on the floor in complete silence. You come in, my buddy. I am a police officer. Are you going for the union here? Hey, you okay? So it's just you in here? I'm Sergeant Tobler. What's your name? I just have one. Where's your sister at? Contact one. You okay? Huh? You doing okay? You don't want to talk to me? Yeah, that's okay. Can you come with me though? Sergeant Tobler would later tell ABC News they initially believed Frankie's daughter was a little boy due to the young girl having a buzz cut at the time. Tobler then tells EF they apprehended Jody Hildebrandt, but the little girl still sits silent, seemingly too afraid to speak. We got Jody out here. You know Jody? She's outside with us. You, you take your time, but I'm in a hurry. I'm a police officer. Did you know that? I don't mean to hurt you at all. You doing okay? Are you scared? Yeah. You're okay. Do you need help? You want to come with me? No. I'm not going to hurt you. Promise. See this right here? It's a badge. It tells me I don't hurt people. I'm just here to make sure you're okay. You're in no way in any trouble. I'm not here to hurt you. I just want to make sure you're okay. And I get you if you're scared. I would be too. Okay? You want to come with me? Still visibly afraid, the officer then offers reassurance to the young child by sitting down on the floor with her. One, zero, one, two, it's okay if I just sit here with you. We don't have to say anything if you don't want to. I'll just sit here with you. A little more than an hour later, EF is still afraid to leave the closet. Sergeant Tobler asks the young girl if she's hungry and would like some food. I'll put the school okay when we're hungry. You can eat. There we go. Thanks, EF. Yeah. EF seems nervous to eat as she stares at the small personalized pizza for several minutes before slowly inching the food toward her so she can take a bite.
Frankie's daughter reportedly eats the entire personal pizza and half of the large one. More than an hour goes by and EF is still afraid to leave the closet as officials take turns to try to get her up, but she's still not budging. One EMT tries to get her to talk, but she said she's nervous. You don't want to talk? Okay. There's nothing at all you want to talk about? It's okay to talk to me. Are you scared? It's unclear what was said after EF tells the EMT she's nervous. However, 10 minutes later, officials reassure EF she won't be harmed. So can we carry you from there? It's the right choice. I promise. Thank you, promise. We helped your brother. And we got him some help, too. And that's what we want to do for you. If we want to get you some help too, we are safe. We will not hurt you and we won't do anything to hurt you. It's unclear what was said next, but after nearly four hours, EF stands up with the emergency responders and slowly walks out of the closet. EF is later taken to a hospital. Hildebrand and Frankie were ultimately arrested. Is this your order? I'm gonna. It's yours if you want it. We'll say that a couple. We also have snacks if you need anything to eat. So I know I introduced myself to you earlier, but my name is Detective Bates, and this is Sergeant Tobler. We're just here to talk to you about kind of a few things involving your kids. So first, are you? Do you live down here or? Or do you live up north? Do you want to talk to me about where you live or how many kids you have? So we just spoke with your husband and he said you guys have six kids. Are those all together? Are those all your kids? I can wait all day, so it's up to you if you want to talk to us about what's going on. Would you feel more comfortable talking to one of us? Or do you want me to take a step out if you want? Or if you feel more comfortable talking to him, I can step out? I'll wait till I have a lawyer. Okay. So you don't want to talk to us at all? Do you want to answer that? Are you, you don't want to talk to us about anything? So, yeah, this, this is just your chance to tell us we're just trying to get your side of the story. Um, so it's your chance to do that. But it's up to you. We're just going to talk. And I mean, I'm not asking any criminal questions. If you don't want to talk to us, just let us know and we'll, we'll, we'll be done. I've already told you. That you want a lawyer? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Easy enough. Thank you. Is there anything else I can get for you in the meantime? I got the water. Do you need a bathroom break or anything like that? No. Okay. Hey Jody, how are you? So I know I introduced myself when we're out there, but again, my name is Detective Bates, and this is Sergeant. We're trying to get you in the paper. Can you sit in the seat for me? It's all about camera angles. You can sit in the house. That's great. Can I get you in the water, snacks? Doing all right? Can be expected. How long have you lived here in Iowa? Mm -hmm. Six years. Six years? The same house? Wow. You married? 
interesting. Where'd you move from? Utah County. Utah County. And how long were you up there for? I'm a little nervous. <laughs> You're that. You know, to be honest with you, if I was sitting over there, I'd be a little nervous too. So don't don't worry about it. We're just here to talk, to get your side. And right now, we're just asking you just typical questions. My county lived here, that kind of thing. I watched so. too many detective movies. <laughs> How are you? Which one's your favorite? <laughs> Me too. You can't, honestly, I, I sit there and I'm married and I sit there and watch a little with my wife and I say, that, like, we don't, that's not how we do it. Hey, that's not right. So don't take, there's some good ones out there, don't get me wrong. But most of them are, are probably a little off base. We're not as mean. I won't get up and beat you up. We don't do that. We just want to get to know you a little, so if you just kind of want to share a little about yourself and what brought you down here. and So I trust my attorney. He said, don't say anything. And I said, I have nothing to hide. And he's like, I know that. But just let me be there with you when we talk. So uh, uh, you guys seem nice people. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm not trying to hide anything. I can't be difficult. This is really, if you knew all the pieces, I think you'd have a lot of empathy. Well, what's going on? That's and really what we're looking that's for. That's what we're looking for. And you're an adult. And the thing about our interview, if we ask you any questions that you don't want to answer, you can just tell us, I don't want to answer that question. But we do want to have a basis and an understanding of what's going on in that home or what went on up north that brought them into your home. Mm -hmm. And so if you want to share any of that and you don't want to answer any other questions, that's okay. I'd, I'd like to just tell you. But I don't, I don't know who you are. I don't know if you're going to flip my words. I, I don't know. And that's the good thing about cameras. Everything, it's pretty much double recorded, audio, video. And it's for the safety of for you and for us because we don't want to flip your words. And this will all be pretty much right there to support you. So we're not going to use anything attorney, against you. be so insistent then. He's an honest, good man. goes to church. I trust him. Why would he say that to me then? I don't know. I don't, I don't know your attorney. Be honest. Well, I'm just but saying he's he's a, he's he's a good, honest man, man. Yeah, and I'm an honest person as well. So we get along great. And he just said, "Do not say anything." Maybe just as an attorney, they just they always say that. Huh? They always want to be with their client. I'm not sure, but like I said, at any time, if you don't want to answer a question, you don't have to. So the ball's really in your court on what you do want to answer and what you don't. So. Well, I think it, it looks sad that I don't want to answer anything, but it's not because I'm trying to be difficult. I'm really hanging on what he told me to do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, who's your attorney? Adam, 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 uh, his father's an attorney, his brother's an is attorney. He, is he local? Yeah. Is it local? Adam. Down um, the street of the... Town Hall is. Okay. They all have the same name. The yeah. whole reason we're sitting here today is we just we there's a lot of questions we have that we just maybe misunderstandings that we just mm -hmm. need to clarify. And I know, and I'd love to tell you if he were here because I don't know, I, I don't I don't know what's going to happen with what I say. You know, I I watched. I'm a psychologist. I've watched people flip things all the time. So I get it. I, I, I sit on your side. I get it. I wish people didn't do that, but they do. Well, if you're not willing to answer any of the questions about yourself, would you be willing to answer any questions maybe about Ruby or Kevin that you could help us understand? We just honestly want to understand what what their dynamic is, what happened to the children, what caused their separation. Right. And after talking to Kevin, it sounds like you know a lot about their dynamic mm -hmm. and their relationship. So if you could help us understand that at the least, that would be awesome. And that's nothing incriminating towards yourself because it's not pertaining to you. So if you could help us understand that. Jody, we're we're going to do this. You asked for your attorney, and we'll, we'll leave it at that. We'd like to maybe talk to you later when you have your attorney here present. Absolutely. And, he, and we'll go he that made an appointment day. at 4 she, on Friday. Made an appointment here. With, at your, at 4? 
he talked to the to the officer okay. and said, "Can we make a time?" And he said out loud, "Do not talk to them." <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, uh, I'll, I'll talk and see if we can schedule that, and maybe that's just something we we just do with your team. Okay. Do you have any questions for us? Anything we answer in the meantime? No. Okay. No. All right. Appreciate your time. We'll uh, I'm gonna have you hang tight in here, and then we'll come back and get you, and we'll be on our way. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. All right, you're gonna have to stand up. All right. Thank you. Go ahead and face this officer. Go ahead and put your hands on top of your head. You know, it's your finger, please. Thank you. Just put your hands on top of your head. You're good. Look to your left. Give you a card with the phone number. Okay, and, then, and then, yeah, you can call Adam and have Adam call us, and we can schedule it, or you can call us and schedule it either way. Mm -hmm. Okay. I'm just going to do another quick check, another I searched you. Yeah. Nothing in your pockets, you have nothing on you at all? Okay, let's go ahead. You can go out the front door to my vehicle out there. Put her on the right side. Hey, Jess? Jessica? Hey, I'm calling. Trying to put her in there. Wait. Okay. Yeah, you can. Okay, go ahead. Car. Judy, this right side of the vehicle, please. Mm -hmm. Size, my okay. Just be careful then. I'm gonna you right here as much as I can. Do you, would it you feel more comfortable? Cuff? Yeah. Put two cups yeah. on it. Go ahead and step on out. I got you. I got you. So he's gonna. Come on out. No more. We're gonna, you. we're gonna double cuff you so that you have more room for your shoulders. And he's sure? gonna take one of your hands out, okay? When he does that, I want you to place that hand on your head for me. Um, I need a third one for uh, her. Just trying to figure out which one would be easier. Okay, put it down on top of your head. Thank you. Hold that one there. I'm going to just put a different cup. So it made it a little wider so your arms are going to be Okay, go ahead and bring it back down. Bring this one back down. Thank you. So now, look how wide that is. Better? Let me double lock it so it doesn't get any tighter. Okay, go ahead and let's get you back. Oh, I got you, as much as I can. Yeah. Hey, sorry, let me go to the other side. Yeah, you can go back there. Here. Yep. Good. Okay. We'll be, we'll be right back, okay? Okay. You got it? I just have a few more treats. Do you have an extra okay. set of handcuffs? I have some in my truck. You want to grab, Can you grab me one? Two needs. Thank you. I'll get them back to you when I get back. So this warrant, Officer Kimes, is going to the property. 
that officer. Put your hands on top of your head, please. Interlace your fingers. Thank you. Put on top of your head. Look to your left. Thank you. I just don't want to hit you in the head. I don't want to cut. Okay. Go down. The ones that locked on the outside. Oh, yeah, they're a little dark. Okay, yeah, I got them. I know you got searched already. I don't buy uh, baits. You don't have anything in your pockets at all, right? You have just these ones only? Okay. Okay. Alright, let's go. We'll go out the front door that way. Hey, just hang on one second right here in the lobby, okay? Okay. Make sure they do. Makes you want to let you know what your what criminal charge is for, so you're under arrest. It's going to be two counts, second degree felony of child abuse or neglect. Okay. Do you understand that or no? Are you okay? I'm wondering if there's like a medical clearance that needs to like do. Do you need medical attention before you go to the jail? No. Okay. Alright, well, we'll have you. As soon as she gets down here, we'll bring you out. Okay. Have you ever been arrested before? I'm just concerned about you. I know you don't believe that. But I've had an opportunity to talk to your husband and kind of worried about your circumstances and obviously your children as well. But you're sure you don't need medical attention or anything like that? Okay. 
Because I worked out for two hours today. So I ironed my three sodas. Yes, you did. Now I'm sweating it off. <laughs> it's so hot downstairs. Oh, God. Oh, it is. I found the AC unit finally. So I turned it down. Oh, down there? Mm hmm. It was 78. Oh, dude, it was bad. Yeah. Yeah, do you, do you probably do another really search? Content? Yeah. It's not where you put or anything, but I'm just going to make sure you don't have anything in your pockets. You're not wearing anything else under this, correct? Mm -hmm. No, ma'am. Spandex? Ma Nothing? You don't remember what you're in? Okay. I just want to make sure that you don't have anything. Just wipe your stance a little bit for me. Yep. Thank you. Okay, so I just spoke, you can turn to face me. So I just spoke with Joey, but you both are under arrest right now for child abuse. And you'll have two counts of that, one for Eve and one for Russell. Okay, so the malnourishment, you guys are in direct custody of those kids. Okay, do you have any questions for me at this time? No questions? Okay, we can open. You got it. Yep. So if you would do as far forward as possible, don't worry about it. Okay. Before we start, we're just going to kind of ask you a few questions about your involvement, okay? So, first you have the right to remain silent. Anything you say can and will be held against you in the court of law, okay? You have the right to an attorney or to have him or her present while questioning. If you cannot afford to hire one, one will be afford or, um, hired to represent you. If you decide to answer questions, you can stop at any time, okay? Do you understand your rights? Uh, I do. Okay. Do you wish to speak to me now? Uh, well, I want to pick up my kids. So. How about this? We're going to ask you some questions, and if you don't want to answer them, you just say, hey, man, I'm not going to answer that. Sure. And just, just say, hey, I'm not going to talk. That's not beneficial to you, and then we're done. So you're no way, and we're no way. And... Sure. You understand that, right? Yes. Okay. Okay, so just for starters, what was your full name? Kevin William Frankie. How do you spell that? K-E-V-I-N-W-I-L-L-I-A-M-F-R-A-N-K-E. And what's your date birth? What's a good address for you? Uh, my, well, I, I'm not comfortable giving my address right now. Okay. But you do live in Springville? I do. How long have you lived in Springville for? Um, I moved there in 2007 with my family. So okay. was and how many? 17 years. So, and how many kids do you have, Kevin? I have six kids. And what are their names? Some of them are teenagers, two adults. So are they all living with you or? No, I haven't seen them for over a year. Any of them? No, none of them. For a year? Over a year. Okay. I've been in a separation. 
from who? From my wife and family. What's your wife's name? Ruby. Ruby. When's the last time you saw Ruby? The last time I saw her yeah. was um, the 18th of, of this month. We met to, she requested me to sign over vehicles or the titles to the vehicles, the vehicle that she drives that were all in my name. When's the last time you physically saw Russell or Eve? Um, the day that I moved out, July 24th, 2022. 24th of 2022? Or and July 25th, July, July 25th. So it's my understanding that, that at least home here in, in KN10 Ivan's, have you been to that home? No. You've not been to that home? Uh, no, I don't know. I don't know what anything that's been going on. Like, like this is good, man. Like I would love to be able to help you out with this, and like I'm seeing a lot of things in this channel because I'm I'm unaware of your involvement in in what's really going on. So for you to say that you're unaware of the status of your kids kind of makes I know that sounds kind of crummy to you, but it sounds kind of good to me. Like who lives in that home with your is it ex-wife? Is it currently a separated wife? Like, who lives in that home with your children? To be honest, I don't know. I, I know that she's there with um, four of the children and our two older children have moved out. They're, they're not at your home in Springville? Uh, and I'm not trying to where, trip you up. I can see you're hesitant to talk to me. I understand that. Well, where where I live? No, yeah. I haven't seen them for over a year. Okay. That's tough. I can only imagine how that feels, man. I got kids. And if not seen them for that long, that would, that would tear a little piece of my heart out. You have age to drive. Does she drive? I don't know. Okay. Like I said, I don't, I don't, nothing is going on in so, their lives or anything going on. How did you find out that you needed to come here to 55 North Main Street? I received a message that I needed to come pick up my kids from the police department in Highlands. And who was that message from? Uh, well, I prefer not to say it right now. It would just help us a lot. I'm trying to figure out who reached out to you because it makes sense that that would happen. I'm just not aware of anyone who did that from our department. Right. And, and I'm not comfortable saying right now who reached out to me. Okay. Okay. So, you haven't seen any of your kids in over a year, you said? That's correct. And then, how old last time you saw her? How old is she now? 16. She's 16? Okay. And then when all the kids left, Ruby took all of them? Um, yes, yeah, she stayed in the house and I moved up. Okay. And did you ever try to reach out to the kids, drop by the home, or no. was there? I honored the no separation boundary that we agreed to. So what there was, was no your separation? Contact boundary, excuse me. Did you have a no contact order in place? Order? No, this was between my wife and my so what did Ruby ask of you when you separated? What did she ask of me? Did she ask you not to contact the kids? Ruby invited me to leave the home mm -hmm. while I um, thought about the, the choices that I have made in my life and the way that I've treated her. Okay. And so I left. And how long had you and Ruby been married before? We were married in 2000. So about 22 years? Uh, when we separated, we were going on 22 years. Yes. Okay. And during your marriage, how was, how was disciplining your kids? How would you discipline your kids? Um, yeah, I'm, I'm not going to answer that question. Okay, that's fine. Have, have you been since separated or since they lived here in the city of Ivan's 
um, have you communicated with your wife regarding like discipline with your kids or their care or their physical well-being? No. So is she doing this on her own and just telling you how your kids are? She's not telling me anything about the kids. Who's this? Who's this uh, female Jody that your wife lives with? Do you do you know a female named Jody? She is a, a therapist and a life coach, I know, and she's... Do you respect her? Uh, do I respect her? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think she's a very honest, truthful person, yes. Okay. You place value on Jody? I don't know what that means. Like, do you, do you, do you value what she says and, and how she... Treats is your wife a client of hers? Is your wife a partner of hers? Is your wife a roommate with her? If your kids are living in her house, is what I'm trying to say. I'm not aware of that, but I know that they've been in business for the last year filming. Who's they? Ruby and Jody. They Ruby film. And Jody, you've been they in film podcasts and. So every week a podcast goes up and I listen to it. And <laughs> What's the name of it? Uh, connections with an X. Like C O N. C O N N E X I O N S. Yeah. And now you support them in that role in doing that and having. Do I support them in the business? Yeah. Like, do you, do you support them and think that what they're doing is a good thing or? Yeah, I support their business efforts. I think it's a good thing. Are you involved with their business efforts, or no? Okay. So just Ruby and Jody. No okay. In the business. Yeah. Yes. Okay. And were you involved in the eight passengers account with your family? Um. Yes. I was in the videos, and if that's what you mean. I briefly learned about this two hours ago. <laughs> so, did Ruby more so do? the videos for the family. Mm -hmm. And how long did you guys do that for? Uh, she started the channel in 2015. And as far as as I'm aware, from the time I left, the last video she uploaded was towards the end of 2021. Okay. And I, but I, again, I'm not aware of anything she's done since our separation. I don't visit the passengers anymore. <laughs> <laughs> chapter of your life that's gone? It, it, it's a past chapter, yeah. So how do you and Ruby communicate? Just through text, phone call? Through text, and if there's anything considered an emergency, we agreed that we would communicate through a phone call. Okay, and do you know her phone number off the top of your head? Uh, the top of my head. Uh, <laughs> no. Okay. No worries. So, how often would you guys communicate while she was down here? Well, I don't know how often or long she was down here. We've communicated maybe four times in 2023 since January. So are you aware of how she disciplines the kids or how she handles no. the kids with behavioral issues or anything like that? No. So you're unaware of how she does that? Yes. Okay. Are you aware of the physical condition of your children? No. No. I'm, I've chosen to trust my wife with the children. That was part of the agreement of our separation is that you allow her to physically provide for the needs of the child you just removed from that and you pay support. I know this is personal questions, but... No, yes, my job is to financially provide for the I was trying to figure out like, how, how much of a role do you play in the caretaking of specifically, is it, of, of those two kids? I, I pay the bills. Okay. So with my, my job, I provide the money, goes into a shared bank account, and that's my only involvement. Okay. Um, look, there's a whole bunch of things that I want to talk to you about, but I, I still can't get over the fact that someone notified you 
to come here to pick up your kids. My guess is, was that was that uh, Jody? No, I'm not going to answer that question. Okay. All all I'll say is. Well, you, Someone you said you trusted them. her. You said that you think that she's not as I asked you if you place value on her, but you, you obviously. She is an honest. I know her to be an honest and a trustworthy individual, and so yeah, I trust her. And um, I received a communication that. And so I left immediately from my job and drove down here. That's all I know. I've come to pick up my kids and to take them home with me. Yeah, do you have your custodial paperwork that says that you're like a... There's, there's no custodial paperwork denying you rights, correct? Uh, there's no custodial paperwork at all. Period. So the kids mine. are yours? They are mine. Okay. Mine, yes. We, this was a, just a verbal agreement between my wife and I when we said mm -hmm. it last year. Well, what questions do you have? Oh, I want to know what's going on and why I was asked to come down and pick up my two kids. Well, and no, a lot of that kind of hinges on who asked you because if we had been the one, like, I'm, I'm not going to say you fit, but I'm, I'm confident a cop didn't call you because we wouldn't have wanted you down here at this point in our investigation. So, having said that, I, I think it's time we, we be honest with you, right? Sure. No, and, and I didn't lie. You're sure, a, someone contacted me, but I don't want to say what You said from your office, but okay. Saying something from my office. Our office. Like, that's no. Someone, that's someone, that's yeah, so we don't know who called you. So right. if we knew who called you, then we could help you. It would make more sense. But. Well, I don't know the legal ramifications of implicating individuals who contacted me. And so without a lawyer here, I don't want to answer that question. That's okay. I but you're, you want to know specifics of the case, which we can't share right now because it's under investigation. So, yeah, so we would like to ask questions about where you found out, but we'll respect that if you don't want to share that information. But I am curious, when you guys had the previous 8 Passengers YouTube channel, you guys got a lot of heat for neglect and child abuse. A lot of people commented those things on there. Why were they commenting those things? That's a good question. Um, we... Uh, we had a son who was acting out in very selfish behavior. Just Chad, or yes, yeah, this was Chad. And you know, none of this is strange or odd. You could get on YouTube and find out all sorts of stuff on this. It's like a double-edged sword. Whereas <laughs> the question is, what do you believe, right? There, yeah. there was even an article written in. Um, Newsweek magazine in 2020 on it, and or news was it Newsweek? No, Business Insider, where we were interviewed and, and we were pretty straightforward and we talked about it and we shared our piece in that. Basically, it boils down to he was being um, very cruel and mean to his siblings that he shared a room with. And so we removed him from the room. And we said, you can sleep anywhere you want. Sleep on the couch, sleep on the pull-out bed, sleep on the floor for all we care, but you're not sleeping in that room with your brother. Uh, he chose to sleep on a beanbag. So nine months later, he had made a lot of changes in his life. And he was ready to, and, and we had moved by that time, and so we had a new house, and he was ready to move into his own bedroom. Made a video about it, and in the video he mentioned something of the effect of, I've been sleeping for nine months on a beanbag. And that is what all the uproar was about. What did you guys do to help, like, with his behavioral issues? Is that... Is that something you and Ruby talked about together? Is mm -hmm. and then did you? Mm -hmm. Helping 
discover yourself and fix behavioral issues and things like that. Is that, is that something you and Ruby sought out to help correct, like some of the things? Yes, and, okay. and I supported it. And so together we held boundaries for our son to support his choosing honest and responsible choices. And when he chose honest and responsible choices consistently is when he began to get his privileges back. And that was, that was, that was the other word, right? Yeah. And, and so, um, but yes, um, through 2000, Contact with him because I'm honoring the no contact separation boundary with, uh, that I agreed to with my wife. But I understand that he's um, 18, living on his own somewhere in Provo and working and supporting himself. What other kids went down to visit Jody? What other kids? Yeah, did you send any of the other kids down to oh, spend time with Jody? to spend time with Jody, they would meet on Zoom. Ah, uh, that makes sense. Yeah, we were in spring stuff. Uh -huh. Well, even in 2019, we would, she would meet with us. So when did Ruby and Jody, to your knowledge, like, decide to collaborate, come together and mesh life? Because that's what it's, that's what's happened. Well, the, they decided to start a business in 2021. So while you, while you and Ruby were together. Yes. Okay. Yeah, and but there were you know at that period it was pretty nebulous. I I don't know. What's yeah. that word mean? <laughs> it was it was just a lot of talk and everyone like saw the plans. It was let's start by you know doing podcasts together and, and then that's all I know. I know that uh, they published a book together recently, you can find it on Amazon, it's not a secret. Um, was business thriving, like life was good between those two? Uh, well, not that I was aware. Well, at some point, and again, I'm not digging into your life, but I'm trying to understand this, at some point, we did took, they kick you out? When you talk about a business, you know, thriving, uh -huh. In terms of business and money, when when we stopped eight passengers on YouTube, we lost ninety percent of our income. Mm -hmm. So to say that business was thriving, uh, in my perspective, no, Got it. I don't think it ever was. After was, that, was that part of your guys's reason for separation after you guys ended eight passengers? Uh, was that part of the reason? Mm -hmm. um, I, uh, the reasons are because of, of ways that I treated my wife and, um, and some um, of my own addictions that I was working through and seeking help on with um, with uh, pornography. Thank you for sharing that. And I, yeah, I've made some wonderful progress. Like, is that something you came to the realization that you needed help and weren't doing things right? Or is that something that, like, Jody helped you guys recognize that maybe Ruby needed more? I'm trying to understand her involvement in your guys' life. Um, She's my focus, I just. Be honest. I understand and I, I can perceive that. 
Uh, Jody and Ruby have a, um, a close relationship, and and Jody saw the need for me to get help, and um, frankly, I agree. I, the space um, has been exactly what I need to face, you know, my own um, addictions and and receive the support and help that I've needed. And so this space has been um, very, very good for me. Mm -hmm. So when you uh, stated that you and Ruby had this no contact that you guys just verbally agreed upon, was that an idea given by Jody that she recommended you guys have that space and not contact one another? I'm not aware of that. It, the, the invitation for me to leave and take space was from my wife. Okay. But that was while Jody and Ruby were friends and collaborating and doing podcasts and sure. Well, you're the you're the custodial parent of each other. I don't see why we can't explain to you what why we're involved. So I don't recall the exact time, but sometime before eleven o'clock today. We received uh, a phone call from 911 on our dispatch that uh, a 12 to 13 year old boy was knocking on doors in a neighborhood asking for food and water. That he was severely emaciated. That he had what is emaciated? Mean? Skinny, scrawny, uh, malnutrition, not enough food, not enough water to sustain life. So he had, I'm sorry, what? he had duct tape on his extremities, on his hands, on his ankles, and those were covering rope burns that were used to tie him down. Take a second and think about what I just said. That's the condition of your son. Given that information, your son was taken to the hospital. A warrant has been applied and granted by the Department of Child and Family Services to remove from your wife's care. So no one right now is going to have access to these two children based on their physical condition. Do you understand that? I understand. Do you, would you condone that behavior? Would I condone that behavior? Um, That's my job. My job is to find out your knowledge of the treatment of these, these based precious on children. No. I bet, again, I don't know the details or I don't know what's going on, but as you described that, that sounds horrible, horrible, horrible. disgusting. No human being should be treated like that. I, yeah, okay. That's my thoughts, but again, we might be different on that. Um. We're going to sit here for a second, okay? We're going to go out and talk. Um, I'm not saying you're, you're still not free to go. Are you under arrest? Absolutely not. We just have lots of questions that we need to figure out. Lots. Uh, okay. Okay. Because your, your children are under medical care right now. And what does that mean? And it means that you don't have access to. Them. My understanding is that they are. What is that? They're in the custody of DCFS. And they will be for the next seven. There's a medical hold on them right now. So for at least the next seventy-two hours, based on our understanding. At least the next seven days. They're in observation. They're, they're being watched. DCFS is going to provide you that information and they can better answer your questions along those lines. That's handled through them. Okay. Right. So we'll be back. So I want you to think about some things though. I don't know. I don't know. Listen, Listen to me. Listen to me. I want you to think about that for a minute. So I have no idea where they're at. Oh, I don't either. But, um... Okay, we're going to hop out here. We'll be back in a minute, okay? That's still recording audio and video, okay? So if you would, don't make any phone calls.
Sure. What's going to happen? It's my wife. I love my wife. I don't know. I'm being honest with you. I don't know. Had had to do with you. I'm going to go charges against my wife. Possibly. I think, given the circumstances, that's highly appropriate. But again, I'm, I don't know your wife. I was hoping to gain some insight from you, but. I don't necessarily know that that's something you wanted to. I trust her. A road you wanted to travel down with me, so. And not without legal representation. Yeah, no, I, I get it. But I love my wife, and I trust my wife. And so, I mean, this feels like getting run over by a steam truck while you're sharing with me today. Yeah, you, I can tell you're caught off guard. I thought I was just coming here to pick up my kids, and mm -hmm. for what, I don't know what or why, but. And I was planning on taking them back with me and just... I mean, I'd love to have a candid conversation with you. I just don't know how it's going to be received by you. I don't know you, but I can tell you my perception of how this happened. Uh, well, but, I'm interested you in that. It's, Look, I'm interested in facts, but mm -hmm. at the same time, I'm... I'm, I'm interested in all the facts. But you understand our facts. Our facts are that you have a child that is emaciated, malnutrition, and has, and has marks. I, I didn't spend any time with her. Sergeant Tobler did. Did any of you spend time with her? Uh, mm -hmm. didn't spend time I, with I have her. not. I mean, she I went to. Today. She was requested to go to the hospital along with Russell, based on their condition. Folks, I don't know what to do. Like, I want to... S you realize that I have a picture of my family on my wall. And I look at it every day. And I work. I work every day. So I can back to my family and save my family. And everything you're sharing to me just sounds like a made up story. Like I I have no idea what you're talking about. Like it's just it sounds like a Horror movie. Oh. And I get you're all you're all doing your jobs. I get. It. And this is, this is my life. I just want my kids. I just want my kids. I just want my family. I don't, know, I don't know what's going on. I, I don't know why these things that you described happen. I, I don't know. It's almost like, I want to say, 
uh, I'm sorry, you, you must have somebody else. Because the, it's like, am, am I in the right conference room here? No. That's what I feel like, it's reality, you know, I'm having a hard time accepting this and dealing with this. I mean, you're telling me that you're taking my kids from me. Oh, yeah. like, we need to transfer the titles of the car to my name, you know, or um, we're going to cancel these credit cards and, and stuff like that. So just stuff related to the finances really is mm -hmm. the, our, our only communications over the past year. Sure. We, we've had zero, like zero communications regarding the kids. Okay. I've had no reason to believe or think that there was anything going on. For all intents and purposes, I woke up this morning looking at the picture of my family and making my commitment today, as I do every day, that I'm going to live an honest, a virtuous, and a responsible life today. And what you're sharing with me just feels like a sucker punch. Imagine. Brianna, do you have yeah, questions? So. Okay. <laughs> if I still have a family, yeah. and um, I, I just. And I know you all have the best interests of my kids at night. Oh. I appreciate that. Thank you. Thanks. That means a lot. I just want my kids back. I want my family back. I want my wife back. I don't want this to sound rude, Kevin. We've got some things to do. We're not kicking you out. But the building's closed. Okay. You're going to be okay driving home? I really am worried about you. Okay. Do, do your best. Breathe. You've got to pull over the side of the road. And Do you drink Red Bulls? Do you want your water to go, Kevin?
We're also hearing from Ruby Frankie herself just one day after her arrest. This is a call from and paid for by Ruby Frankie Purgatory Correction. An inmate at Purgatory Correctional Facility. This call is subject to recording and monitoring. If you don't wish to talk, hang up now. After less than 24 hours in jail, Ruby makes a call to her husband, Kevin, who reminds her the call is being recorded. Okay, well, you know that this phone call is being recorded. Yes, that will come out. That will come out. Almost right away, Ruby asks whether she's making the headlines. Are we in the news? It sounds like that at least you're in the news. I don't know about me. I don't know what he's talking about. But. In early conversations with Kevin, Ruby calls her arrest a witch hunt. I'm wondering if they went to Sherry to like ask her questions. I don't know. He's looking for public. I, I know they are. And a couple months ago, Business Insider was reaching out to me, and I ignored their email. But um, I'm going dark. This is a witch. I'm not at BYU. I'm not at BYU anymore, so I don't know how they're going to find me. Yeah, maybe it was a blessing. This is a witch hunt. I, I, the devil's been after me for years. At first, Frankie doesn't show any remorse, saying children can be full of evil. Adults have a really hard time understanding that children can be full of evil and what that takes to fight it. You've seen what it takes to fight evil. It's not the person you're fighting. And it can look like something it's not. And you've been there, you know that. And so I don't know any adults who are going to see the truth. So I'm calm about this and I just pray that you'll hang in there. The next day, Ruby speaks with Kevin again and even defends Jody Hildebrandt. The most upsetting thing is that I am completely misunderstood. That is the most horrible feeling. Like my own family misunderstands me, they misinterpret me, and, and poor Jody, they, they misinterpret her, they misunderstand her. She puts her neck out on the line for people and then they get mad at her. I mean, it is just horrendous. It's horrendous. Ruby seems to realize the legal implications ahead, but still blames the entire situation on Satan. He's 35 years in this, and he said, even if you are acquitted and um, are released, they will place legal restrictions on your access to the under 18 children. I figured such. I figured such. God told me. God told me when I was driving before I called you. I didn't have any information. I didn't know anything. And the Spirit said, your children are going to be removed. And I just, I cried out loud. I'm like, no, I'm not, I'm not done. I'm not ready. And God told me I'm done. And I, I just, oh. So. Satan has taken everything away from me that I love. And I'm a good woman. I don't do naughty things. I don't do naughty things. I'm a really good girl. But the next time we hear from Ruby in late October, she's changed her tune. <clears throat> I can't say everything that I want to say, but um, I really did feel it. I really did feel like the arrest was like a rescue. Like I just felt so many angels around and it was like a release. It was just really kind of surreal, kind of strange. Um, but I, I just keep thinking about, you know, President Wilson's talk, you know, things so show and I know he's said in the past about my ethic thinking and <coughs> And he's, he's given a lot of context to, you know, how small this life really is. And I'm just so grateful how many people, you know, will go to the grave not, not having woken up. And I just, I want to use this time. And I am using this time to, 
So please, please be patient. Do what I can. But live with no way. I love him and my family. And <clears throat> I've had many experiences here to kind of guide my thinking. A month later, Ruby says time away from Jody has cleared her head. I could not come out of this without, without his grace, without his mercy, without his help. This has been the strangest and the most miraculous intervention. It, it put everybody where they needed to be. It separated me from Jody, so I'm not hearing her. And I think just being gone and not hearing her has cleared a lot of things up for me. Ruby and Jody both pleaded guilty to all charges against them in December of last year. Ruby is caught on a recording discussing the pleas and future court proceedings. Did you did you see that Jody pled guilty today? I did see that. Yes, is that a relief for you? Mhm. Mm yeah, it's a big relief. It's a big relief. There, there would have been positive the other way, too, had she not pled guilty. There's enough evidence that she would have been, could have been convicted for life, but um, that would have been messy. It would have been really messy, and the kids would have. So, um, so do you and her get the same outcome no matter what now, or is there a chance that it would be different? That's a that's a really good question. That's one that I've asked Lamar. Um, no, we can still have different outcomes. Ruby theorizes that Jody pleaded guilty because she knew Ruby would testify against her and expected Jody would lie about her mental health history. She can lie on her paperwork, and she probably will. I don't think she's going to give them her history, but I think in the interview it's going to be apparent that she's mentally ill, um, and so that will affect how long someone, you know, because they're looking, how, how repentant are you? How much responsibility are you taking? How how are you aware that what you've done is wrong and she's not she's the only reason she pled is because she didn't want to do life and she knew I would testify then Ruby reveals the last time she spoke to Jody was the day of her arrest when was the last thing you talked to her was it that day mm -hmm. it was when we were arrested yeah I went I left early in the morning to go to a dentist appointment with Julie. We left at like 3 in the morning and she calls me sometime in the morning and I and so I went back down but when I got to the house, I mean it it looked like it looked like the movies. There was a red fire truck. There was a black van with tinted windows. There was there were two ambulances. There were 20 cop cars. I mean, it was, it was. Did you just sit in your car? No, I, I pulled up and found a spot to park. She lives on a cul-de-sac. I parked in the cul-de-sac and I walked up and the, the driveway was just full of cops and I just walked up to the cops. And they said, they said, are you the mother? And I nodded my head. And so they took me in and put me in the casita. And I sat there for a couple hours. I just sat there. Ruby then explains that with time, she got a clearer picture of what really happened. But Ruby Frankie's jailhouse calls aren't the only ones we're hearing. As long crimes Elizabeth Milner explains, we also hear from Jody Hildebrandt. In the newly released jail phone calls, Ruby Frankie's former business partner, Jody Hildebrandt, is showing no remorse for the abuse inflicted upon Frankie's children. But it was like everything got taken out of the house and it's in the storage unit so that I could come to jail. 
know, it sounds crazy, but it, it really feels that way. And I don't know if I'm going to be like some kind of example, but when I get out of here, I have a story to tell, and I am I'm going to try to do everything I can to protect the children because that's what's happening is that kids are being just horribly abused. And and instead of the kids, anyways, it's, it's a story, but when you come, I'll tell you about it. So what I'm saying is you're being crucified in public opinion, so your fear has to be super prepared and the only way he's going to get prepared is if you push him and ride him okay I will I'll call him today he doesn't seem really animated he seems like you know the pictures the pictures are going to destroy you and I'm like we didn't do that we didn't do that those pictures we did not do he did that to himself yes did we put that on him and then he rubbed around and cut himself yes but we didn't do that in a later phone call, Hildebrandt can be heard visibly emotional, but still defending her actions. I marry you, Janet. Nobody wants the truth. Nobody wants the truth. Nobody wants the truth because these kids, you know, I told Doug, I woke up, the spirit told me, it's all the devil. I mean, you've seen him. I mean, I've known you, what, for five years? You've watched him come at me, come at me, come at me, come at me. And you're exactly right because he knows I know what he's doing. And he uses these kids, and he uses all of us as the adults, the parents that don't hold the kids accountable. So now it's, it's abusive to make a kid sleep on the floor. It's abusive, or it's abusive to, you know, it's ridiculous. It's ridiculous. You can't even raise your kids anymore. In a February recorded call after Hildebrandt pleaded guilty, she refers to Bible scripture while leaving a coded message to a man she's speaking with on the phone. So there's a section... He's talking about um, talking about the second coming, and you know I'm coming from this place of I was just getting ready to move, and all of a sudden I ended up in prison. You know, like what, what the world? And um, you know, one day you'll know all the details, and it'll, it'll all make sense. But if I could talk in code here, um, <laughs> so he said, um, "This is the Lord talking to the disciples." They asked him, like. Um, when shall these things be? Like, when, when are these things going to come to pass? And so he starts talking to him about the last days. And he, he says he, that nation shall war against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. But, and then he goes, but before all the, these that he just talked about, they shall lay their hands on you. Now, I have been praying for five months, like, explain this to me. Like, what is going on? Like, I'm willing to go there, but please let me go right side up. Like, if you want me to be there because you want me to be there, then, then great, great. I will not resist it at all, but please help me understand. So I read this this morning, and I just wept and wept and just thanked him and thanked him and thanked him because it just all click, 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 click. So he says, but before all these things, you know, nation rising against nation, they shall lay their hands on you, and I'm like, <laughs> and prosecute you. And at one point, she said she's happy to go to prison. And he says, and ye shall be betrayed by both parents and brethren and kinsfolk and friends. I'm like, oh my gosh, that's exactly what's going on. And some of you shall be caused to be put to death. And ye shall be hated for, by all men for my name's sake. And then he goes on to say, you know, and I never read that before, but like I've never been in prison. But I just read that and I just wept. I mean, the spirit was like, he just said, this is you. So then I read, I read in Mark, so that was in, that was in um, Luke, and I read in Mark the same kind of thing, you know, because the, the Gospels, they, they wrote similarly. Um, so he said, now the brother shall betray the brother to death, and the father the son like the father will betray the son. And the children shall rise up against their parents and shall cause them to be put to death. That statement right there is what's going on with me. The children shall rise up and put their parents to death, and ye shall be hated of all men for my name's sake. I just, I mean, I, I probably cried for an hour straight. Just everything clicked. And I said, I'm 
happy to go to prison. Because <laughs> if, if you if you continue to read the rest of the of the chapter, he's like, be be grateful. If you're in this situation, be grateful because you're you're one of them, and you, know, you will be saved. And, and, and this is <laughs> yeah. But I have just been begging him, like, you've got to explain this to me. Like, I cannot logically figure out what's going on here. And, and that's it. That's what's going on. And the spirit, I mean, I just was, I, when I feel the spirit, I have two physiological reactions. I get really, um, like, shaky, like I'm, like I'm shivering, like I'm cold, or I feel heat, like I have a fever run through me. And I was, I was, like, burning up. It felt like I was burning up. And I was just shaking with gratitude, like, here's your, here's your answer. Here's what this is. But in First Peter, chapter 4, um, between verses 12 and 19, I can't remember exactly how he says it, but he's like, when you have something happen to you and it just feels like it's random, it's not random. Like, like this is intentional. <laughs> like, you're, like, like you, you're, you, it's not just some crazy act of events that's going on. This is, like, intentional. And that, that first Peter chapter 4 was another one of the um, footnotes to refer to, you know, that reinforced all this other stuff. I'm like, okay, this is just some crazy random event. <laughs> has purpose for this. And then I connected it to my blessing. Because my blessing I've been reading like several times a day and the blessing is pretty pretty clear. The my first the first paragraph of it says, you know, these are words directly to you from your Heavenly Father. And according to your faith and diligence, um, You'll, they'll either be a comfort to you or, or they won't be, you know, so however much diligence and faith you want to put in. And then the next paragraph talks about, um, it says, you are a special spirit chosen and reserved for these last days and sent forth to the earth in great clouds of glory to share the gospel and prepare the people for the return of the Savior. And it, and it says, um, one of the reasons you were sent here is to share the gospel. The strongest message you will ever teach is the power of your example. And then he says, through the power of your example and the spoken word, or no, he says, um, your tongue will be loosed and you will be able to teach the gospel in far and distant nations. And then he says, uh, through, the, through, the, through the power of your example and the spoken word, you will be a great tool in the hand of the Lord in teaching the gospel to many. So this whole paragraph about an example, an example, an example, I'm like, well, what's a better example than to go to prison unjustly <laughs> and then go teach the gospel, go teach the gospel. Like Ruby Frankie, the former YouTuber turned convicted felon, now serving prison time for abusing her children in the name of religion. Frankie documented it all in a journal, and we have the disturbing details in her own words. Thanks for joining me for Crime Fix. I'm Anjanette Levy. If you thought that the abuse that Ruby Frankie's children suffered was bad, I can assure you it's much, much worse than anything that you imagined. Frankie documented the abuse and justified it by claiming her children have Satan within them and that demons have visited them. The journal starts in May of 2023 with a note stating that Jody Hildebrandt received a blessing from a temple president. What that blessing was and what it pertains to is somewhat unclear. In late June, Frankie wrote that her son refused to do wall sits. He says he is done. The following day, Frankie wrote that the boy is to stay outside, sleep outside, only to come in to use the bathroom and shower. After that, several pages are black. They're redacted. So there are pages and pages of information that we're not seeing. The journal picks up in July as Ruby Frankie's journal details the horror that her 12-year-old son and 10-year-old daughter endured over the next three months. I won't be using their names as they are the victims of horrific abuse. Frankie wrote about her son, turns 12 tomorrow. I never envisioned him still being 12 and pooping and peeing himself, 
satanic choices leads one to become destitute, even in the most affluential homes. Then the next day on her son's birthday, Frankie wrote about her daughter and son being in so much deviant behavior, they won't control their bodily functions. They're both furious. Their selfish, sinful lifestyle is being intervened upon. I told R he emulates a snake. He slithers and sneaks around looking for opportunities when no one is watching. And then he scurries. If he wants to emulate the Savior, then he needs to be 100% obedient. Ruby Frankie then said that her son lies all the time. He's a compulsive liar. This entire experience is a shock to my system. She wrote that her son has a cold, dead heart, and he's always been able to get what he wants. On July 14th, Frankie wrote that her daughter, quote, refuses to work, screams, has her hair shaved off. Frankie repeatedly shaved her daughter's hair when she didn't comply with her demands throughout the summer. The girl was only 10. Can you imagine? You shave off your daughter's hair because she refused to work. And we don't know exactly what kind of work she was refusing to do, but we can only imagine, given what we have learned about the abuse, this was just the beginning of the summer of hell for these kids. Frankie said she told her son that he needed to divulge everything, that he needed to pray and to fast. He's workable and calm for a bit, and then angry and defiant the next. The only consistent thing about R is that he lies. That's what Frankie wrote about her son. She followed up by writing that her son told her he would rather have a glass of water than have her as a mom. Ruby Frankie then described July 11th of last year as a big day for evil. She sent her son to stand in the sun with a sun hat, but the boy's demons, she said, wanted to stand in the shade. So Frankie said she got a cactus poker to push the boy into the sun. Later, she poured mop water on him to cool him off. The children were forced to fast, but really it sounded more like they were being starved. They were continually told that they were lying and that they needed to repent for exactly what? No one really knows. If you can engage a weak-minded soul in a physical activity of obedience, you can begin to break the bond of Satan made with the weak. Ruby Frankie wrote that Jody Hildebrandt volunteered to help her with that. They planned to buy a ranch in Arizona where the children could do more hard work to rid themselves of Satan. At one point, Frankie wrote, the kids need a good kick from a horse and a cactus to run into. There were times when Frankie and Hildebrandt placed Frankie's daughter in a closet and refused to give her water if she screamed. Quote, she screamed for another family, water, food, care, love, a manipulative ploy. You are loved. That's what Ruby Frankie wrote about her 10-year-old daughter. The girl was also made to jump into a cactus. Frankie said her daughter was actually cuddling with it, calling it inhuman. In late July, Frankie wrote about her daughter, we put her in the closet to contemplate what to do. She screams much of the day. She doesn't get water if she screams. She refuses to eat. The next day she wrote, Jody wakes from a dream. God lets her know that we have done everything we can to get her attention. They also forced the children to pull weeds from a cemetery for hours at a time and to pick up glass. Frankie's 12-year-old son was forced to jump on a mini trampoline for long periods of time and to balance on one foot. On August 27th, toward the end of the children's torturous captivity, Ruby Frankie wrote about her son, spent the 22nd through the 25th peeing and pooping. He is out of control. He is defiant, abusive, mean, Willing to try anything that would grab his attention, I whipped him with a belt yesterday. E2. Frankie then said her daughter peed all over Jody's garage floor, screamed at her, and lied to her. She is out of control. How did you get the ropes on you? Three days later, on August 30th, the children had reached their breaking point. The 12 year old boy escaped from Hildebrandt's house and went to a neighbor for help. With me to discuss the horrific horrific information in Ruby Frankie's journal is somebody who's an expert in psychology and psychiatry. He is Dr. Daniel Bober. He's a forensic psychiatrist. Uh, Dr. Bober, you read through this just as I did. Your first thoughts on what you've read. Absolutely horrific. Um, heavily redacted, but the details that are in there are very disturbing. Why, why do you think it was so heavily redacted? I mean, we have pages and pages of black. I mean, we have black boxes, of course, but then we have pages 
full of black. Why would the law enforcement officials in the courts redact that information? Maybe too personal, too disturbing, as if the rest isn't disturbing. It's it's just, um, yeah, maybe there were things in there that were they just felt were too intimate to share. It's very hard to know. I'm trying to imagine a world, uh, you know, I'm a mom. I'm trying to imagine a world in which I look at my children, ages 12 and nine or 10, somewhere in that range. And I think to myself, you, Satan is within you. And in order to drive Satan out of you, my, my friend Jody here, she's going to volunteer to take you to, you children, you young kids, to her house. And you're going to be starved. Uh, you're going to be forced to do physical labor, collecting weeds and glass and what have you from a cemetery for hours at a time, um, being poked with a cactus, held underwater, forced to stand out in the sun, because that is going to drive Satan out of you. What, where is that coming from in Ruby Frankie's mind? Well, you know, ironically, it actually happens to be the parents who are often the perpetrators uh, with these victims of abuse. One in seven children in the last year were abused, about 600,000 last year. And we know that the parents are most likely going to be the perpetrators. But in this particular case, clearly there was something that was not right with this woman, whether she had her own abuse her own mental illness. I've never obviously examined her, so I cannot say. But there are certainly people that have what we call an authoritarian form of discipline that's based on coercion, control, sort of breaking the will of the child. But this takes it to a new level. So clearly, there is some form of mental illness going on with this woman. We obviously don't know what it is. We don't know her background, her trauma, maybe her own maltreatment. But Clearly, this is not just a, a normal form of parenting. This is going on with, uh, or was going on, I should say, with the 12-year-old and the 10-year-old. I'm not going to use their names. They are, they are victims of abuse. Um, there were other children. Um, in the, but it was these, these two children were singled out. We know there are older children and then children younger. Um, can you think in your mind as to why these two children were singled out for, for this abuse. I mean, Ruby Frankie is, is telling herself in these writings that she's, and I don't quite understand it, like why she thinks her children are so possessed. I, I have some, my own theories, but because of the redactions, I, I can't really get too deep into that, but she thinks they're, they, they're being influenced by the devil. But why these two young kids, 12 and 10, why are they being singled out for this horrific abuse and maybe not the other kids? Well, the younger kids are the easiest targets. They're the most vulnerable. They're the ones that have the hardest time fighting back. But I think what this story tells us is something much larger in society, which is this whole concept of what I like to call the Facebook fallacy or the Instagram illusion, is that people watch this mother. She became an overnight sensation. At one point, she had over 2 million followers. But it just goes to show you that everything you see, everything you hear, you have to question. You have to be skeptical. You have to be cynical because all these people that are posting this stuff on social media, we develop this opinion of them. But we, we know that with people, you only get two things, what they show you and what you want to see. So this is a, a, a perfect example of how an image can be manipulated in society to make people believe that people are a certain way when nothing could be further from the truth. And I, I don't, she did have a lot of followers, but I don't think anybody ever thought Ruby Frankie was perfect because she, I mean, people were raising concerns about this for a long time, saying this woman, the way she's treating her kids on YouTube and on TikTok or what have you is not right. But, but that pales into comparison um, in what is written in these documents and what Ruby Frankie documented uh, why on earth would somebody, in your opinion, um, document all of this abuse? It almost makes me think like she thought she was doing the right thing, but I, I, I don't understand how someone in the name of God could think that they were doing the right thing by having their children do things like carry heavy boxes upstairs and stand out in the sun and, um, you know, as punishment, run up hills and, you know, stay in a closet without food and call it fasting. I, I, I just don't get it. Yeah, well, maybe it was something that she was taking to a delusional extreme. 
which is why she made no attempt to conceal it and, in fact, document it. Uh, I think it's very important what you're saying. You know, she didn't really try to hide it. Uh, and people had expressed concerns for a long time. Uh, we're not just talking about the people that were watching her YouTube, but the people that lived close by were telling police for years that there's something going on. So I wonder what the role of law enforcement is in all of this, because it feels like they kind of dropped the ball. They didn't respond to all these pleas for help. And this is not a, you know, the, the only time that we know of that law enforcement kind of didn't really follow through on something. You know, they obviously have a tough job. Uh, and they're overworked and they're underpaid and they're outgunned. But in this particular case, if calls were made to 911 and there was no follow through, I think this went on a lot longer than it needed to. Much longer. I mean, if this begins in May of 2023. The kids escape the house in late August. This journal ends on August 27th. I mean, she details the whole summer. The whole summer is in this 60 pages of documents. And she talks about, you know, these kids. Uh, you know, being ungrateful. They're, I mean, she, it, they're kids. I mean, they're like 12 year old and 10 year old kids. They're, they're probably just doing things that children do. Um, right. And well, they're I'm, being I'm also, a, I'm also a child and adolescent psychiatrist. And I can tell you that I have this conversation with parents all the time. They say, well, how do I discipline my child? It's the difference between taking away something they want and something that they need. You know, if you're not letting them play with their toys, that's one thing. But if you're depriving them of a meal of nutrition, that is abuse. Yeah, I've never heard of fasting for a child. Maybe if you're getting blood work done, but I mean, giving the child, you know, just like lentils and yeah, there's really no legitimate medical like reason for that. Right. Yeah, it's disgusting. Um, you know, there were some other things in here too. She's talking about this 12 year old, how he's continuing to, um, you know, he's defecating himself and wetting himself. Um, there are some kids I know that take a really long time to to be able to, you know, like there's something going on with the brain. It, it's not communicating with the bladder. Um, you know, she's talking about him wetting himself and defecating himself a lot. There are s some kids who just, especially boys, overnight, they just won't wake up to go to the bathroom and stuff like that. I don't know if that was part of this, but she's talking about how disgusting he is because he's defecating. He's pooping himself and peeing himself. I mean, it could be a reaction to the abuse he's enduring. Absolutely. Absolutely. I could not have said it better myself. We know that kids very often are nonverbal and they can't talk about their feelings. So they will express their feelings as sometimes a change in bowel or bladder habits. That can be a sign of trauma. That can be a sign of abuse. So you're right on target. There's also a humiliation aspect of this that I find so disturbing. Um, the little girl, you know, they're saying, basically, we're going to shave your head. Ruby keeps telling her, I'm going to shave your head. If you make any faces at me, I will shave your ha hair off. And she did that several times throughout these documents. And that to me, it's like, you're a, you're a girl. And a lot of girls, not all, but a lot of girls have longer hair. And That's part of their identity. It's what, yeah. It's what makes us um, a girl. who we are. Right. Makes right. me a girl, right? Makes me right. a girl. When I was a kid, I always had long hair. I've got longer hair now as an adult. Right. Um, and that to me was like, she was just trying to shame her and humiliate her along with the physical abuse. Absolutely. Another form of physical and emotional abuse, shaming them, depriving them of something that's part of their identity, humiliation, all part of the abuse. Um, and I know I'm asking you to speculate here. What kind of mental illness could Ruby Frankie suffer from? So it could be some form, some form of severe trauma, possibly dissociation. It could be psychosis, that she's literally out of touch with reality. Um, maybe even drug or alcohol use. We just don't know. It would be pure speculation to say. Um, and if the fact that she didn't try to conceal it and she documented it and she basically handed the prosecution their case, you know, makes me think that maybe she wasn't completely in touch with reality. But I wouldn't know unless I spoke with her. And I looked at her own um, documents and records. There was another disturbing aspect of this. <laughs> I mean, the disturbing aspects go on and on. I don't know what it's. It just gets worse and worse. But they were going to buy property, Jody and Ruby, according to this diary. And they were going to buy property in Arizona and move the kids out there. 
so they could continue because whatever they were doing in Utah was not suitable enough. So it needed to be much harder. The work had to be harder. That's the only way you become obedient and compliant and that you resist Satan. So they're going to move them out to a ranch in Arizona. My God, I, I, I fear for what could have happened to these kids had the boy not escaped and gone for help. They could have died. Yeah, well, they would have been even more cut off from anyone that could have helped them, more isolated. Uh, as horrific as it is, it could have even been more horrific. What is it going to take for these children to get through this? I mean, intensive therapy, obviously, but what what will it take? Will they will they ever be able to recover from this and and get stronger from enduring this? I mean, I I know it's hard for you to say that having not met them, but I I just can't even imagine. These poor kids, what, they, what they've gone through and what they will continue to go through. We know that victims of abuse have much higher rates of depression, of anxiety, of insomnia, of, or, of all sorts of mental illness, post-traumatic stress that they will probably have to deal with for years. It probably will take years of therapy, years of treatment for them to develop any kind of trusting relationship with another human being. Well, let's hope that they're able to somehow get to a point where they can flourish and, and recover to some degree. It's going to be a process and take a long time. Most uh, important thing Frankie, is, that they're away from these, is that they're away from these people is the most important first step. Most definitely. And they are where they belong.